All right, I wanted to do something a little different from my normal type video and talk about engine failure after takeoff and at what point is it possible to do the dreaded impossible turn. We've all heard in training that, hey, if an engine fails at low altitude after takeoff, don't attempt to turn back to the airport. That's a high risk maneuver. Instead, pick a spot straight ahead, maybe 60 degrees on either side of your nose, find a, find a field or suitable alternative and land there instead of trying to turn back. But sometimes you have limited off airport options in front of you. If your airport's surrounded by fields, then your decision is simple, but if you're surrounded by dense city, forest, mountains, or other unforgiving terrain, straight ahead and turn back might both be high risk options. So what should you do? We've heard it called the impossible turn for years, and there's good reason for that. A lot of the slides in this presentation are gonna be from uh, an EAA video, which I will link in the notes. And the panel there, they studied a bunch of NTSB reports, six years of NTSB reports of single engine airplanes having engine failures after takeoff and analyzed the, the results there. There was over 300 such incidents. Of those NTSB reports, 30% tried to turn back. Of the group that didn't turn back, they had 8% fatalities those that did turn back had 29% fatalities. So on first glance, you're like, well, yeah, okay, doing the turn back is a higher risk maneuver. It has a higher chance of fatality. Now, I will make the caveat that this is just NTSB reports, and NTSB only investigates when there's significant damage, injury, or fatality. So I know that there are popularized incidents on YouTube and elsewhere of people making the impossible turn. And of course, if they make it back safely, it doesn't ever make it into the NTSB reports. So those, those aren't factored in, but trying to get the best data we can, that, that's pretty much all you can do other than those you know, one-off anecdotes is, is to check the NTSB report. So it's not a complete data set, but it's, it's the best we can do. What is it exactly that causes the increase in fatality on the turn backs? Let's drill down a little further. Of those who turned back, 74% were below 600 feet. Of those, about half of them stalled. Now, if we take those groups and you look at those who stalled, 70% had fatalities. But those who didn't stall, only 4% fatality. So the risk of the impossible turn isn't so much missing the runway, it's stalling. As long as you don't stall, the fatality rate is quite low even if you do a turn back. So now why are pilots stalling? There's a few different reasons. The first is a failure to immediately lower the nose. With lack of training, pilots don't react as the speed bleeds off. And the longer you wait before you give the downward pitch, the more downward pitch needs to be applied to regain speed. Now, I've read a lot of articles and seen a, a number of YouTube videos about what you can expect in an engine failure and what it takes. And a lot of them say, man, they're really surprised at how much forward stick you have to push to maintain the airspeed. Well, every airplane is a little different. On the Sling TSI, you don't really need a lot of forward stick. You just need to not pull back on the stick. I trimmed the airplane up in a VY climb and just pulled the engine to idle and did nothing with the stick. And the nose drops on its own, pretty much protecting its airspeed by itself. So you just have to fight your instinct to, to pull back. You know, you're pitched up in the air and, you, and your engine quits. Some people have the instinct to pull back on the stick because you want to maintain that pitch or you want to maintain your altitude. Well, that's not what you're trying to maintain at that point. Airspeed is life. You're trying to maintain airspeed. So if you just, on this airplane, the Sling TSI, if you just don't pull back on the stick, if you let the nose drop, you'll be halfway where you need to be as far as me, uh, protecting the airspeed. The second reason why pilots stall is obviously you're doing an increased bank angle to get back to the airport and when you increase your bank, the stall speed increases. With lack of training, pilots turn harder and harder trying to see the runway thinking, that's what I need to see, I need to see the runway, that's the thing that's going to keep me alive and that's not what's going to keep you alive. Keeping your airspeed is what's going to keep you alive. Get, people get the, the steep turn in there, maybe they keep turning steeper and steeper, or they pull up harder and harder, and they get themselves into an accelerated stall. And an accelerated stall at low altitude is most likely unrecoverable. And then the third reason why people stall 
let's say you successfully get the turn back and you start heading towards the airport and now you realize in real time for the first time that your airplane is maybe incapable of making the runway and under those particular conditions and you start seeing the, the runway go up on the windshield and you see yourself getting lower and you're like I'm not gonna make it I'm not gonna make it you keep pulling back and pull back and eventually you you stall you need to protect your airspeed above all and one last data point from the 300 plus NTSB reports of everyone who turned back only one aircraft that had a total power loss actually made it back to actually on the runway. Based on everything we know so far, what we do know is the odds of actually making the runway is somewhat low, but the fatality rate is also low as long as you don't stall. But what we don't know is can your make and model even make it back to the runway at any altitude? Most people assume any airplane can make it back as, as long as you get high enough, and we're going to find out here in a minute that that's not necessarily the case. And if your airplane can make it back, at what altitude is it safe to attempt to turn back? And then where can I find this information? As shown before, for years the FAA's called it the impossible turn. Well, now the FAA is telling the CFIs to teach a 180 turn back after an engine failure, after takeoff. And they're saying that once the student gets this training from the CFI, they'll be able to determine when it's safe to turn back or not. And yet, they give no guidance on how to determine when it's safe to come back. There's no formula, there's no numbers, there's just no guidance. And of course, manufacturers don't publish a minimum safe turn back altitude because they're not required to by the FAA, so they don't. So how can we as pilots know when it's safe to attempt to turn back in our airplane? Many have attempted to answer this, and there have been many people who practice simulated engine out at low altitude after takeoff, and you've seen probably some videos of this. But there's also been a number of accidents of uh, even CFIs and students attempting these at low altitudes. The steep turns and low altitudes are a risky combination, so I don't recommend you try this at low altitude. There are some that have done it in a very wide open plains area where you have no obstacles and maybe it's a private airport and we don't always have the optimal environment to practice those so in general I don't recommend practicing engine out steep turns at low altitude. Others have created a safer way to determine what your minimum turn back altitude is but are they accurate? Here's something from the AOPA that they recommend. Go up to a safe altitude which is good, start a climb between VX and VY Pull the throttle at some point, do a five second startle factor, roll into a 45 degree bank, pitch for best glide speed, and do a 270 degree turn. Note the altitude loss, then add 50% for a safety margin. Okay, and you come up with a number and you think, okay, this means at this number, this is the altitude that I can turn back. And then this is from a, a CFI refresher course I did recently. It's, it's pretty much the same thing, but here he says you need to do a 360 degree turn to account for maneuvering back to the runway. So in other words, it's like 180 to get turned around, another 90 to bring you back from your lateral offset to get you back to center line, and then another 90 to line you up for the center line. So he's saying to do a 360 degree turn, but it's still basically the same concept. Note the altitude loss in a 360 degree turn and add 50%. Okay, you might do this in your airplane and you, th and you think, okay, I got a number now in my head that I know I can get back. But there's something missing from these analyses. And what is that? It's distance. All they're determining is the altitude lost in the turn. They're not factoring in your climb gradient, which is how far did you go away from the runway to achieve that altitude? And then your glide ratio, how far you can travel per foot that you lose when you come back. So you, you can do these exercises, but you really have no idea whether you can make it back from any particular altitude under any particular situation. Is there a better way? So those previous methods were, were better than nothing. Back in the day, we didn't have digital avionics. You know, you're just out there trying to come up with the best estimate you can with the tools that you have. But now we've got better tools with advanced avionics. We effectively have digital flight data recorders in our airplanes. This group, in-flight metrics on the EAA video that I linked to below. 
they went out and said, well, let's, let's use these new tools, these digital flight data recordings, and actually run the numbers and, and under different scenarios and, and see when you can make it back. So what they do is they record takeoffs, and now you have the trajectory of your takeoff, of your climb gradient, how much height you can get per distance. And then at a safe altitude, they go up and record turnbacks. And now they know how much altitude you lose in your turnback and then how much you lose in your straight glide back to the runway. And then they could take those two snippets of data and they could glue the turnback onto the climb data at any point they want. So they could say, well, would we make it at 300? Would we make it at 500? Would we make it at 700 feet? Would we make it at 1,000? And then you could really determine for that particular airplane when it could make it back. And so he took his Cherokee 140 out. He noticed that at 300 or 500 or 700 or even 1,000 feet, this particular airplane could never make it back which was kind of surprising to him. He figured at a thousand you'd have it. So he's like, well, clearly I just need to get higher. So he kept going, 1,500, 2,000. And then it dawned on him that this airplane, no matter how high you get, you could never make it back to the runway under no wind conditions. This is because the climb gradient that it had was so weak that by the time you reached what you would think would be a safe altitude, you're too far away from the airport to make it back. So really it's the combination of your climb gradient and your glide ratio that is gonna tell you if that particular airplane can make it back and if so, when. So what about our airplane, the Sling TSI? You know, this Cherokee has 140 horsepower and a max gross weight of 2150 pounds. The Sling TSI has pretty similar horsepower and max gross weight. So with a similar power to weight ratio, if the Cherokee can't make it back, does that mean the Sling TSI can't? Well, let's find out. Now I can tell you, before even running the numbers, I felt pretty good that the Sling was going to make it because having flown Cherokee 140s, it's a known pig as a performer. And the Sling TSI is well known to have a very good climb gradient. But they both have similar power to weight ratios. Let's find out if the aerodynamics uh, makes a difference. Of course it does, but. So Rick at InFlight Metrics generously agreed to analyze the data for my Sling TSI. I would perform multiple takeoffs and practice turnbacks while recording the data via ForeFlight and G3X. And I'd send the data to him and he would crunch the numbers and send me the nice graphics as results. First, I had to figure out what speed do we fly in the turn back. The EAA has a panel of aeronautical engineers and test pilots on their turn back project group, and they recommend a 45 degree bank angle for the turn back. It turns out that a 45 degree bank angle flown at the proper speed will result in the least amount of altitude loss in the turn back. A lower bank angle results in too much time to turn back and ends up resulting in more altitude loss. Not to mention, it gives you a wider turn radius, which will leave you further offset from the center line and harder to align with the runway. Bank angle steeper than 45 degrees results in too much loss of the vertical component of lift, and even though the time around the circle is shorter, you'll end up losing more altitude. And also, since as we said earlier, stalling the aircraft was the biggest contributor to fatalities, Increasing your bank angle beyond 45 degrees also increases your stall speed exponentially. So that's just another reason to avoid steeper than 45 degree bank angle. With that in mind, the stall speed at a 45 degree bank angle in level flight is increased by about 20%. Of course, we're not doing a level turn here. We're doing a descending turn. So it would be slightly less than that in your G loading, but we'll just keep that as, as a rule of thumb. And then we want to add some safety margins. So if your stall speed at 45 is 1.2 times your clean stall speed, to add margin, let's do 1.3 times your, your stall speed. Now the Sling TSI, the clean stall speed, the VS, is 55 knots indicated. And 1.3 times that is 71.5. And it just so happens that the best glide speed in the Sling TSI is 72 knots. So it's pretty much the same. So perfect, we've got one speed to remember. 
your turn back speed and your best glide speed are the same 72 knots indicated. A few tips in the turn back, and I'm going to show you my video here in a minute, but it's really easy if you haven't, if you don't do this frequently, and we don't, we don't practice this very often, most of us, it's easy to find yourself chasing the airspeed. To counter this, you want to have target pitch attitudes for your airplane as a starting point, and then you can refine from there. On my airplane, when I'm doing VY, it's about 12 degrees nose up, and then when I do my turn, the 45 degree turn back at best glide, it's about pitch level to the horizon, plus or minus a couple degrees, depending on how accurate your speed was when you established the bank. If you get a little fast, it takes a few more degrees nose up to get it slowed back down, and then vice versa. The speed can get low if you didn't allow the pitch to drop. Like I said, this, the sling, will, the nose will drop itself if you don't fight it. And then the opposite is true. If, if, even if you entered right at your best glide speed, once you establish that 45 degree bank angle, the nose wants to drop and so you can easily overshoot your steep turn. The other thing is staying coordinated. It's a little more difficult than, than you might expect, especially uh, in, the, in the left turn. But when you're climbing, you obviously you got right rudder in, the engine fails, you need to lose that right rudder. And then if you're going to do a left turn back, you need left rudder as you bank into it. Right turn is a little easier because you know you got right rudder to climb, let the nose drop. Even if you just kept the right rudder in there as you banked right, you need right rudder in the bank anyway. So that kind of makes it easier to do the turn back to the right. But the left can be a little more tricky because you go from right rudder to no rudder to left rudder. And it's important to stay coordinated because, as we said, the biggest driver of fatalities in the turn back is stalling. If you stall and you're uncoordinated, that's going to result in a spin. And a spin at low altitude is very likely unrecoverable. Definitely more, more so than just a stall. Either one you, don't, you want to avoid, but you certainly don't want to spin. So I went up in my airplane to record my turn backs. My airplane, the speed indication at low speeds is, is about seven knots high. So I'm using V speeds that are seven knots higher than the book. Uh, you should determine what your stall speed is in your airplane at max weight during your phase one. Anyway, that's why you, you'll see in the videos I'm using 82 knots is my VY and best glide is 79. All right, I'm gonna try to record my turn back maneuvers. I'm established on, where is it? I've got traffic. He's 1100 below me, I see him. No factor. All right. I cleared the area other than him. I got the strobes and the wigwags on. I got traffic selected. I'll wait for him to go by just to be on the safe side. But my plan is to uh, start at 5500, establish climb power, go to VY, which is 82 on my airplane, at 6500. I'll simulate that's basically 1,000 foot above the simulated field elevation. I will simulate an engine failure, count a uh, four or five second startle factor off, then enter my uh, 45 degree turn back and try to maintain my best glide, which is 79 on, on my airplane. And yeah, that's also bomb. the best turn back uh, speed. 72 for the published airplane, 79 on this specific airplane. Yeah, and then I'll uh, I'll do more than 180 degree turn back, and I'll maintain that best glide until I'm a, you know back down to below 5500. So I will have glided from 6500 to 5500. Start on a west, end up a little past east, so maybe zero eight right, zero. Up on your left side. So I want to pull the power back on this airplane. The nose comes down by itself, which is good. It helps me protect my airspeed. Then I'm gonna also need some Rock rudder adjustment because I've got, I'll start with about 12 degrees nose up with right rudder in, engine fails, I'm gonna have to transition to left rudder. And let the nose fall down, establish 45 degree bank and hold that best glide. Simple. All right, let's do it. All right, 95 down, or 95 percent power is my basically uh, fine power. I'm gonna pitch for 82. I'm looking for 
There's my 82. About 12 degrees holds that. Might be slightly higher at, for full power. 100 feet to go, where we'll start the simulated engine failure. Speed back. All right, 6500, simulated engine failure. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. All right, 79 is, we're already there, so I'm going to hold that. 45 right degree, now, trying to hold that. Oops. Cool. Look at that, look at that, look at how much rudder that takes. Man. So tricky. I almost hold this best glide till I'm below 50. I'm gonna go ahead and do one more tank swap while we're over Pell City, just make sure everything's working right. Roger, I'm gonna back away from you just a second. Then. 1897, thank you. Alright, I'm at my best glide. I didn't hold the speed all that well, but and now I'm dropping below 5500. So we'll call that a turn back. Not a great one, but... Well, I might as well just do it. I started on the east this time. Establish my VY again, go up to 6500. This time I'll do a right turn. And I was surprised at how much left rudder that took when I rolled it in there. I had it pretty ball pretty much centered until I rolled it in. Alright. There's your 95%. There's your uh, 82 knots. And I'll hold it up to 6,500. Still no traffic in the area. So the two things I notice is how difficult it is to hold the speed with the 45 degree bank angle. Uh, how much difference the rudder changes and how quick the rate of turn is. You get turned around 180 super fast and with not, an, not a lot of altitude loss. That's a good thing. All right, 82-ish, coming up on 6,500. Still clear left and right. Engine failure. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. Bank angle, 45, shooting for 79 on the speed. Boy, see, the, as soon as you get that 45, the nose wants to drop. And it's real hard to maintain. I'm looking for 79. That's pretty decent, that one. And there's past 180 already. Level it out. Hold 79 until we get below 5,500. descent rate at best glide and now it's down to 650 but I'm also a little slow and of course you could feather the prop and get a better glide ratio less sync rate all right seven to eight hundred feet a minute and we're through a thousand feet I did more than 180 so I'm gonna do it again Try that left one again. That wasn't a very good left one. 
Alright, I'm just I'm just gonna go to seven thousand. And this will be a left turn. And that guy is way behind me now. I see him, he's also way below me. In opposite direction. So we're at eighty two, climb power, we're looking for seven thousand. Simulated engine failure, 1-1000, 2-1000, 3-1000, 4-1000, 5-1000. Looking for 7945 degree bank angle. Boy, it just drops. The nose just drops. Alright, trying to get 79. A little, there, 79. And we're back to 180. On the turn. 79, that traffic's still 2,000 feet below me. And I'm uh, gonna hold this until uh, 6,000 feet. Why wow, my speed is all over the place on those, uh, for some reason, more on the left turn than the right ones. You're adjusting a lot at that time. The bank angle, the pitch, the rudder, trying to maintain the speed. But in any case, we're in no danger of stalling. We're well above a stall speed at all time. Never really got much of a stall warning. And the, the turn rate to come back on the 180 was super fast. They get turned around quick with not a lot of altitude loss. All right, there's my 1,000 feet. I'll call that good. Uh, hopefully that's a decent recording for turnbacks even though I didn't execute them very well but best I can do for today so I wanted to record multiple takeoffs to see what difference it would make whether you climbed a VX or VY or a cruise climb or, or whatever. And so I did four of them. The first one was at VX. The POH for the sling TSI says retract the flaps no earlier than 300 feet. So I retracted them around 400. I did the same thing for VY. And then I did a, a cruise climb, which is as soon as I got a positive rate, I retracted the flaps and then I went to 95 knots. A lot of guys like to do that because even a VY climb in, in the sling TSI is, is a pretty high nose up pitch attitude and it's difficult to see over the nose. So a lot of people are more comfortable with just going to a, a cruise climb of 95 or so right off the runway. And then I wanted to see just out of curiosity, what if I maintained VY but I never retracted the flaps and just kept the flaps in all the way up to a thousand feet. Would that make my climb gradient better or worse? I think the important thing to look at here is the bottom line here, the bottom row here, is the distance from liftoff to 1,000 feet. So for VX, it was 67.53, considerably longer distance for VY, and longer again for a cruise climb. And then VY with the flaps all the way was actually worse than VY and retracting the flaps above 400. So then we had my three turnbacks. I did a left, a right, and then a left. And some were sloppier than others, and some were better than others. But the altitude loss in a 180 degree turn is about the same on all three of them, about 300 feet. The next line here is the startle time. I tried to do about a four to five second startle time. And this is an important thing. A lot of the videos you see out there where people are taking off and doing the quote unquote impossible turn, they take off and pull the engine and immediately start their bank angle and they turn back and say, look, I made it in 500 feet or whatever. But that's not a realistic scenario because they know the engine failure is happening and they start their turn right away. But in, in a real life scenario, we're human beings and we're not going to be perfect. And there's a startle factor and there's a, a denial that this is even happening to you. And then maybe you have an instinct to troubleshoot at first, which is not the first thing you should do at low altitude. You want to establish your speed and figure out what you're gonna do, you know, either do your turn or, or go straight ahead, hopefully have that decision made ahead of time. Troubleshooting is something you do when you have more time, but point is, we're not perfect and we're not gonna just immediately make the split 
second decision. So that's why the folks at Inflight Metrics recommend the four to five second startle time. I did that in my video, as you can see. And then you see the turn radius there. So your turn diameter is double that. So you maybe get 1,300, 1,400 feet off the center line, but you're several thousand feet away from the end of the runway, typically, depending on the length of the runway and your, your climb angle. And so usually getting back uh, to center line is not an issue. And if you notice on the, the data-driven tracks, the turn back, the track is like a teardrop. It's not this big 270 followed by another 90 sort of question mark looking track. It's not really like that. It's more of a teardrop thing. And again, those are without winds. And if, if you've got a crosswind, it's going to be even easier because the crosswind is going to make you drift downwind and then you're going to make your turn into the wind so it's going to be even easier to line up with the runway and then you can see how well i held my best glide speed and my number two turn back i thought was my best turn in as far as in the 180 but i didn't hold my glide speed as well in that one and as a result uh, i ended up with a a worse glide ratio on that particular turn back so here's the first one. This is a takeoff to 1,000 feet at VX in my three different turnbacks. And you can see in every case, I made it back to the runway easily with altitude to spare. And the end of the blue lines there are the point at which the altitude equals the field elevation. So you see in this case, and this is on a 6,000 foot runway, I had ample altitude and made it back to the runway with plenty to spare. And I probably would have had to dump the flaps in and probably would have landed some distance down the runway. But the point is very easily making it back. And I should have mentioned all of these that I did, I was about 90% of max gross takeoff weight. Here's VY, again, up to 1,000 feet with all three of my turn backs. Makes it back to the 6,000 foot runway in a no wind condition easily with plenty of altitude to spare. And here's cruise climb. And even on a cruise climb from 1,000 feet with all three of my turnbacks, makes it back to the 6,000 foot runway with not as much, but still some to spare. And then my VY with uh, leaving the flaps in all the way up to 1,000 feet, still makes it back. Not as good as VY and retracting the flaps as recommended by the POH. So that was just something I wanted to try. So now this is a shorter runway. This is the various different takeoffs with one of my turnbacks, which is like my average turnback. And you can see even here, VX, VY, and cruise climb, I still make it back to the, even the shorter runway under no wind conditions with a little bit to spare. So this is the worst case scenario. Takeoff three with the cruise climb and my worst turnback to a short runway you make it back, but just barely. So had this been a 3,000 foot runway or a 2,500 foot runway, I would not have made it back at 90% max gross weight, no winds, doing a cruise climb with this particular turn back. So those were all based on an engine failure 1,000 feet. So now we want to figure what is our minimum altitude for turn back? We use the data that we collected on my flights, and you can see the data we used on the right here. And we wanted to determine what's the minimum altitude for turn back. Now, certain caveats here, these are experimental only. Wouldn't use these for aeronautical decision making because the performance of any particular aircraft or pilot under any particular scenario may be better or worse than what we captured. But it, it gives you an idea. It's great for discussion and learning. So that's what we're doing here. So this determined that the minimum altitude for return, and, and this is based on a VY. So at a VY with no wind on a 4,000 foot runway, it shows that we can make it back at, at 685 feet. Okay. So a longer runway would be better, or a VX would be better, or a headwind would, would be better. This is what it would look like if you did a turn back at 500 feet. And it shows us, you know, this is a VY again, that we would be 750 foot short of the runway and 150 foot laterally offset from the runway. So we wouldn't have the sufficient altitude to complete the realignment turn. Now, 
you throw in a TED knot headwind that drops the minimum altitude to return by 150 feet. Same airplane, same weight, same climb speed, but now a 10 knot headwind, we make it back at 535 feet. So the headwind makes a huge difference. It increases our climb gradient, and it also improves our glide on the way back. So thanks a lot to Rick at InFlight Metrics for that analysis. So as you can see, there are tons of variables that need to be considered. Runway length, your gross weight, density altitude, wind, both the headwind and crosswind components are significant, airport layout, and your own proficiency. Here's runway length, which is something that a lot of people don't think about as being a factor in turnbacks, but as you can see, this is the guy's Cherokee that wouldn't make it back. And you can see it ends up about 3,000 foot short of the runway. So if you had a 3,000 foot longer runway, you would have made it. Weight, of course, that increases your ground roll and reduces your climb angle. It doesn't really affect much the altitude loss in the turn of the glide angle, but it affects how far it takes you over the ground to get to a given altitude. And of course, that's going to affect your ability to make it back. Density altitude or engine power. In the EAA video, the guy showed just from going from one Cherokee to another or one 172 to another, an airplane that had a newer engine or a slightly more powerful engine could make it back while the other one didn't. And I'm throwing density altitude in here because that also affects your ground roll distance and your climb angle. And I know some of you are thinking, well, hey, the, the Sling TSI has got a turbo, so it doesn't lose power with an increase in density altitude until you're above the critical altitude. But you actually lose thrust because your propeller is acting on less dense air, so it's going to produce less thrust. So even if you maintain the same actual engine power, you're going to lose thrust of the propeller, which is going to increase your ground roll distance and decrease your climb angle. Wind, as we saw in the analysis of my airplane, having a 10 knot tailwind drop the minimum turn back altitude by 150 feet. This drawing here sort of depicts why that is. This is the guy's Cherokee again that couldn't make it back on a no wind day, but if he had a 14 knot headwind, he would have made it back. It has the effect of improving your climb gradient, and of course you're heading back with the tailwind, making it more likely to make the runway. Crosswinds are a factor that we need to be considering. When you're taxiing out for takeoff, we're used to listening to the ATIS or AWOS or looking at the windsock and determining which runway to take off. But you should also be considering which way is the crosswind, and you'll want to make your turn back into that crosswind. And the crosswind has a kind of a double benefit of you're going to drift downwind away from the center line. That's, you know, we fly runway heading, we don't fly runway track. So we fly the runway heading and let the aircraft drift downwind. So now you're already offset for your turn back and then you turn into the wind. And so that makes it easier to align with the runway. So if you don't have a crosswind at all, you might consider offsetting to one side. So if you do have an engine failure, it'll be easier to align back with the runway. So your airport layout makes a difference too. If you've got an airport like this and you take off, I don't really care whether I have a crosswind or not, or you know, I don't really care that much if I make the runway, as long as I make the airport, it's a huge field there. So I can land perpendicular to the runway and I'm still fine. But if you got a runway like this, where it's just carved out of the forest and there's just one runway and then landing perpendicular is not gonna help me. So I really need to align with the runway. So need to consider what the crosswind is and if there isn't one perhaps offsetting so my turn radius will make it easier to turn back so you let's say you offset to the left and you make your turn back to the right or vice versa and then of course the other thing is to consider your proficiency practice your turn backs regularly make sure you can maintain your safe airspeed practice dead stick landings it's best to do that with a cfi so they can pull the engine at times that you're not prepared for and of course be there for backup is safety. So it's a ton to consider and there's no way you're going to consider all this in real time after an engine fails. So you need to consider all these things on the ground at ground speed zero and even then 
it's just a ton to consider. So you want to do a mental checklist before takeoff, considering all the variables, including your own proficiency, determine if you would consider a turn back in the event of an engine failure at all, and if so, what would your minimum altitude be? Note the winds at the surface and at the lowest altitude for winds aloft, and between those two you can kind of interpolate and determine which way the crosswind is. Uh, if you're heavy or if you're on a short runway or if you don't have a headwind or if you have high density altitude, that's a time when you might consider climbing at a steeper angle. Maybe do a VX climb instead of VY or a cruise. If you're super lightweight or if you got a super long runway, then sure, go ahead and do your cruise climb. You might be okay. But these are the things you got to weigh against each other. And then the other thing they suggest to do in the EA video is, is identify off-airport emergency landing sites around your airport. Now, if you're traveling a lot like me, it's, it's not really practical to do that in every destination that you go to. But you can certainly do it at your home airport where, where you're flying in and out of a lot and have an idea of what, what's around there. As you can see, it's a lot to consider, and there's no way that you're going to come up with the perfect mathematical formula in your head. Even with the data that we have, it's based on the temperature at that day, the weight that we were at that day, and yeah, he took the winds out of the equation, but in real life, you're going to have winds. That's going to make an effect on your turn back. The headwind reduces your minimum turn back altitude and density altitude, you know, so there's really no way for any of us to sit there at the end of the runway and plug some numbers into a calculator and have it spit back a number of when it's safe to turn back. And you're certainly not going to be able to do that in your head. But hopefully this information has given you an idea of when it might be okay to turn back. You're just going to have to make a judgment call and decide whether it's worth it to turn back or continue straight ahead. Now, the sling has some advantages that other airplanes don't. It's got, a, it's got a really strong climb gradient. It's got an excellent glide ratio. And it's got a couple aces in the hole. And one is, if you've got the Airmaster prop, which most of us do, you have the ability to feather the prop. Now, the 12 to 1 glide ratio in the manual is without the prop feathered. Feathering it is most definitely going to improve your glide ratio. I don't know exactly by how much. At one point, they had the number 16 to 1 in the POH, and that sounds reasonable as a, an improvement from a windmilling to a feathered prop. But they took that out, so I don't know if that was accurate or not. So, But anyway, as you turn back, if you find yourself in a situation, obviously you turn back to the runway and you're not going to make it. Feathering the prop is, is going to give you an improved glide ratio. And the last thing is a sling has the option of a ballistic parachute, which I have. We'll discuss that in another video because this video is already too long as it is. But hopefully this has given you a lot to think about and given you some guidelines by which you can make your own decision. So I, I would run this by your CFI, maybe watch it with them, maybe do some practices with them, and hopefully be able to make a more informed decision in the event something like this happens and hopefully it never will. Thankfully the Rotex engines are super reliable as long as you maintain them properly. Hopefully this never happens to any of us but it's good to have this information should the worst happen.